History is written by the winners, and not only in books, it's also in our streets, our mountains, and in the monuments we raise. The naming of these is important because it fires our sense of self, culturally, socially, and politically. Scotland's past is mixed. We were a country of colonialists, a country where many people profited from the transatlantic slave trade, a country where a world-renowned philosopher, a hero of the Enlightenment, wrote that black people were inferior to white. Often, when features were named after what we would now consider lamentable aspects of our history or our heroes, they were done so in their own time. As we grow as a country, society and culture, we can choose whether to update those we honour in our built environment to chime with our values. To do so is not to change our history, we can't change that. Thousands of pages, not only of history, but also of drama, poetry, thousands of paintings attest to the fact that our past can be difficult to reconcile with how we live now. It is another country, but we can choose those we want to honour. That's what this is about. Our streets are heavily memorialised towards old, white, mostly conservative men, but the reality is that our history is much more diverse than that. What we have doesn't tell the whole story, but it could. Re-evaluating who we choose to honour with a memorial of one kind or another tells us who we are now, but it's also an opportunity to view our history with the benefit of time. Sometimes the people worth memorialising are not immediately apparent. We need to review this. So where are Edinburgh's monuments and memorials, the ones that tell the dark side of our history that are more appropriate for our museums, art galleries, in lecture halls, in schools, but not really appropriate for our built landscape? Let's give our young people ancestors to genuinely look up to. People think it's only Glasgow that named its streets after the site of plantations, but well, Welcome to Antigua Street. Jamaica was the locus of the greatest Scottish investment in plantations in the West Indies. Henry Dundas, also known as the King of Scotland, delayed the abolition of slavery by over a decade, consigning hundreds of thousands more Africans to the transatlantic slave trade. This is his son. What if, instead of a statue of Robert Viscount Melville, we had a statue of Jane Henning, matron of the Jewish Girls' School in Budapest, who was arrested by the Nazis in 1944 and died in Auschwitz. What if instead of a monument to Henry Dundas, we had a monument to the valiance of the women of the Scottish Women's Hospitals, whose headquarters was in that building in the corner of the square. They saved thousands of lives during World War I. Admiral Eyre put down a slave uprising in Jamaica with such ferocity that he was actually recalled to Britain. What if this was called West Place? After Rebecca West, who was one of the preeminent journalists of the 20th century, her coverage of the Nuremberg trials in the 1940s is legendary. Like Eyre, Rodney was a Georgian British admiral who advanced slaving and colonial interests throughout the world. This is William Ewart Gladstone, who's Prime Minister of Great Britain and his father was a major slavery investor. Gladstone inherited all of that wealth, but he was a Democrat and last week, the Gladstone Library issued a statement saying if it was inappropriate for his statues to still be up, Gladstone would have agreed that they should come down. So what if, instead of a statue of William Ewart Gladstone, we had a statue of Mary Brunton, a hugely successful Regency writer who gave Jane Austen the idea for her book, Emma. The Duke of Northumberland, like many establishment figures of the day, had slaving interests, but the real baddie in the family was the Duke of Cumberland, also known as the Butcher. The Duke of Cumberland not only had slaving interests, but also was the perpetrator of repression after the defeat of the Jacobites at Culloden in 1746. Some historians have called it a cultural genocide. What if instead of this statue to missionary and colonialist, the terrible missionary, David Livingston, we had a statue to a female geographer, for example, like Isabella Bird, who travelled in America and in the Far East. Uh, her papers are kept in the National Library of Scotland. Or Isabel Wiley Hutchison, who pioneered a lot of our understanding of Arctic geography and Arctic culture. What if instead of David Hume, we had a statue to Alexandra Mary Chalmers Watson, who's the first woman to receive a medical doctorate from the University of Edinburgh, and whose sterling work throughout her life laid the groundwork for what would later become the Scottish National Health Service. 
Let's give our young people ancestors to genuinely look up to.